Hello and welcome! Today's edition of Jane Austen On Point is being produced as part of Virtual Jane Con 2021. My thanks to the incomparable Bianca Hernandez Knight for having us back again this year. It's truly an honor. If you're new here, hi, I'm Cassiani. I'm a historical dance enthusiast and an English country dance teacher and caller who specializes in Regency dance and all things Jane Austen. This series, Jane Austen On Point, is mostly dedicated to analyzing dance scenes from Jane Austen movies and TV adaptations. But for today's video, we're going back to the origin of it all, the actual Jane Austen novels. That's right, I'm going to be reading ballroom and dance references from Jane Austen's novels and analyzing them from the perspective of a Regency dancer. I had intended to cover all the novels in one video, but I only have an hour to do this, so for today we'll only be covering Pride and Prejudice, Emma, and Northanger Abbey. But don't worry, I'll be analyzing the others very soon. But before we dive into Austen, I thought it would be interesting to talk a little about historical dance research and the sources and scholars I use for my videos. I rely on the research of some very dedicated historians who have devoted many years of their lives to researching Regency dancing. They do their research by finding and studying documents from the period that mention dancing, anything from newspaper articles to advertisements, letters, journals, memoirs, novels, dance manuals, books of etiquette, and even copies of the published rules for assembly balls can all be extremely useful in helping us piece together what dancing was actually like back then. Any piece of writing that actually dates from the Regency and mentions dancing can help us. And we can learn things by looking beyond mere writing too illustrations of dancers, designs of dance shoes, fans, fashionable hem lengths, and even skirt shapes for dancing all can give us useful details about dancing in the past. And yes, Jane Austen's novels are considered a historical source for Regency dance information. And they, along with other novels written in the Regency era, play an important role in helping us understand how dancing worked in practice, not just the ideal described by dancing masters. Historians have to be careful not to make undue inferences or project modern assumptions onto the historical text they read. The meaning of the words can shift over time, and that holds true for dance terminology as well. For example, some dance figures like swing your corner means something very different in the Regency than it does in modern dancing. And we know this because the description of that figure that survives in Regency dance manuals doesn't match our modern description even remotely. Similarly, 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 calling a dance in the Regency meant something totally different from what it does today. In modern parlance, calling means to prompt the figures of the dance for the other dancers, but in the Regency, it simply meant the right to select the tune and figures for an English country dance. When researching these videos, I try to keep up with what dance scholars are writing and to read the primary sources they cite in their papers when I can. I feel fortunate to live in a time when so many old books are available on PDF online so that I can educate myself without leaving my house. If you're interested in reading Regency Dance research yourself, I highly recommend Paul Cooper's research papers published on regencydances.org, which also has links to PDFs of works cited when available, as well as a database of historical dance sources that are available online. I also recommend Susan DeGordiola's blog, Capering and Kickery, kickery.com, which is full of interesting research from all different historical eras of dance, with a lot of research on Regency dancing in particular. Some other online databases, in addition to the links at regencydances.org, can be found at the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library, the British Library, the Library of Congress, and the Library of Dance. I also want to highly recommend Alison Thompson's book, Dances from Jane Austen's Assembly Rooms. It's only available in print, but it's a treasure trove of information on Regency dances in general, and Jane Austen in particular. So if you're a Janeite wanting to learn more about the dances in her books, this is the best resource I can give you. But that's enough about research. You all came here to hear me talk about Jane Austen. So let's look at her novels. We'll start with Pride and Prejudice, because of course we're going to start with Pride and Prejudice. The first dance scene we'll look at is the Meryton Ball. The Meryton Ball is an assembly ball, which means it's a kind of public ball that was usually held in a large space used for social gatherings like an assembly room or an inn. Anyone who could afford a ticket could go to an assembly ball, though in theory exceptions could be made for people of bad character. So with that brief overview of assembly balls in mind, let's look at the text. 
Mr. Bingley had soon made himself acquainted with all the principal people in the room. He was lively and unreserved, danced every dance, was angry that the ball closed so early, and talked of giving one himself at Netherfield. Such amiable qualities must speak for themselves. What a contrast between him and his friend! Mr. Darcy danced only once with Mrs. Hurst and once with Miss Bingley, declined being introduced to any other lady, and spent the rest of the evening walking about the room, speaking occasionally to one of his own party. His character was decided. He was the proudest, most disagreeable man in the world, and everybody hoped that he would never come there again. Amongst the most violent against him was Mrs. Bennet, whose dislike of his general behavior was sharpened into particular resentment by his having slighted one of her daughters. Elizabeth Bennet had been obliged by the scarcity of gentlemen to sit out for two dances, and during part of that time Mr. Darcy had been standing near enough for her to hear a conversation between him and Mr. Bingley, who came from the dance for a few minutes to press his friend to join it. Okay, so here's what I see about the dancing in this scene. First, let's talk about the fact that Mr. Bingley is angry that the ball closed so early. From what I gather, assembly balls tended to have broadly similar rules, but there were still some variations. The most common hours I saw for public balls was either from 8 till 11 or from 9 till midnight. With that in mind, one interpretation of Bingley's anger could be that he was used to slightly later hours for balls. And another interpretation could be that he was used to attending private balls in London, and those generally started later and lasted much longer than public balls. In fact, it wasn't uncommon for private balls to start around 10.30 and last till close to dawn. For more information on this topic, I'll link some of Paul Cooper's papers, ones that give examples of rules of assembly balls, and some others that cite newspaper coverage of private balls in London that went almost all night. As for Mr. Darcy, the fact that he wasn't acquainted with people should not have prevented him from finding a partner. At assembly balls, it was taken for granted that everyone had been introduced to the master of ceremonies, and he could then introduce anyone who needed a partner. In fact, this was one of his duties as master of ceremonies. A mutual friend could also introduce you to a potential partner, which is what Bingley tries to do for Darcy. But the point is that even a stranger who was totally unacquainted with the rest of the company could get a partner at a ball. The fact that Mr. Darcy declined to be introduced means that either Mr. Bingley or the MC, or both at some point had tried to get him a partner and he'd refused directly. It wasn't unheard of for people to sit out for a dance back then, and many people, especially chaperones, wouldn't be dancing at all. But it would have been seen as rude for a young single gentleman to directly refuse, especially if it was pointed out to him that there were ladies who needed a partner. This would show a serious lack of gallantry on his part. It could also potentially prevent ladies from partnering with each other because we have surviving rules of etiquette that said that same gender couples could not form as long as a person of the opposite gender was disengaged. Jane Austen herself often danced with another woman when the gender balance was off, as evidenced in her letters. You can check out this article on rules for assembly balls for examples of the limits placed on same-gender partnering. The last thing that struck me from this passage is that Mr. Bingley came from the dance for a few minutes. We can safely assume that the dance from which he came was an English country dance, because that was the standard dance for public balls of the era in the UK, though other dances like reels, cotillions, and quadrilles could be called between country dances by permission of the Master of Ceremonies. For those who aren't familiar with the form, English country dancing in the Regency era consisted of long lines of couples performing a sequence of dance figures that repeated over and over again. They performed these figures in groups of three couples, starting with just the top couple dancing the figure sequence with two other couples as needed. The top couple would gradually work their way down the line, moving one place down with every repeat of the figure sequence and incorporating one new couple into the dance each round until they got to the bottom, at which point everyone in the set would be dancing. Only the couples dancing down were considered to be actively dancing because they got to do all the figures in every repeat of the sequence, whereas the other couples only joined in as needed. But eventually, each couple would reach the top of the set and once they had two or more couples to do the figures with, they got to dance down as the active couples themselves. This would continue until every couple had a turn to be active and to dance all the way down the set, at which point the dance was over. 
I've included this diagram from an 1813 dance manual by John Cherry for reference to show how this progression worked. And here's a link to a PDF of the manual so you can look at the whole thing yourself. So I thought I would stop here and explain what this diagram is. You'll notice that you have all these columns. Each column represents one iteration of the dance. And within that, the groups within the bracket are the group that the active couples are dancing with. If you see an asterisk next to the letter, that means that is the active couple. If there's not an asterisk next to the letter within the brackets, those are inactive couples who are figuring with the active couple. You'll notice that it starts out with just one active couple moving down the set. And when that first active couple has moved down three places, they have enough room for another little set to form with another new active couple at the top. And then that one will move down three places and a third new active couple will start. So now we have three active couples going down the set all at once. And then finally, a few rounds later, there's four more. So you can see where we started out with just the first three couples dancing. And now when you get to round nine, the whole set is dancing and it continues to involve almost the entire set for the rest of the dance. This snowballing format of dance progression meant that if you were standing farther down the set when the dance started, it could be several minutes before the top couple made it down and incorporated you into the dance. And you just had to stand there waiting in line until it was your turn. This was considered to be a feature and not a bug because it gave you several minutes of unchaperoned conversation with your partner, so it was a great way to get acquainted with someone. To relate all this back to the passage in question from Pride and Prejudice, it becomes plausible that if Bingley and Jane had started the dance fairly far down the set, Bingley would have been able to step away from the dance for a few minutes without disturbing the flow, leaving his partner to hold their place until he got back. Put a pin in that thought about how easy it was to do other things while being inactive within a dance set, though, because lots of shenanigans happen in Jane Austen novels while people are standing inactive. Moving on to the next passage of interest, we get some relevant information from Mrs. Bennet when she gives a description of the ball to her husband. Jane was so admired, nothing could be like it. Everyone said how well she looked, and Mr. Bingley thought her quite beautiful and danced with her twice. Only think of that, my dear. He actually danced with her twice, and she is the only creature in the room that he asked a second time. First of all, he asked Miss Lucas, and I was so vexed to see him stand up with her. But however, he did not admire her at all. Indeed, nobody can, you know. And he seemed quite struck with Jane as she was going down the dance. So he inquired who she was and got introduced and asked her for the next two. Then the two third he danced with Miss King and the two fourth with Mariah Lucas and the two fifth with Jane again and the two sixth with Lizzie and the Boulanger. First, notice just how Bingley first saw Jane. It was while she was dancing down the set and he would have been relatively inactive making his way up. So he had time both to notice a pretty girl while she was dancing down and to find out who she was so he could be introduced. I told you a lot of stuff goes on while people are inactive during a country dance. Next, it's obvious from the point Mrs. Bennett is making about it that Mr. Bingley's dancing with Jane twice is a big deal. But beyond the obvious reason that Jane was the only person he asked twice, let's look at some other reasons why this would have been significant. To begin with, dancing two pairs of country dances with someone in the Regency would have been a significant time commitment. Country dances generally lasted 15 to 20 minutes, give or take, based on the number of couples in each set. And because it was customary to ask someone for two dances at a time, you would be with the same partner for at least half an hour and possibly even 40 minutes. And if Bingley asked Jane twice, that would add up to somewhere between an hour and an hour and a half of time together. You can see why everyone suspected an attraction. And you can also see why dancing with a stranger would be intimidating to someone as introverted as Darcy. Mrs. Bennet mentions six pairs of dances that Mr. Bingley did, and then the Boulanger, which was a customary dance used to end the evening. The text also says that Mr. Bingley danced every dance, so that means that A, there were only six pairs of dances total plus the Boulanger, and B, Jane danced with him for roughly a third of the evening. I would definitely say that's showing a preference. 
The next notable mention of dancing comes a few chapters later at an evening party given by Sir William Lucas. Mary, at the end of a long concerto, was glad to purchase praise and gratitude by Scotch and Irish heirs at the request of her younger sisters, who, with some of the Lucases and two or three officers, joined eagerly in dancing at one end of the room. Mr. Darcy stood near them in silent indignation at such a mode of passing the evening, to the exclusion of all conversation, and was too much engrossed by his thoughts to perceive that Sir William Lucas was his neighbor, till Sir William thus began. What a charming amusement for young people this is, Mr. Darcy. There's nothing like dancing after all. I consider it as one of the first refinements of polished society. Certainly, sir. And it has the advantages also of being in vogue amongst the less polished societies of the world. Every savage can dance. Sir William only smiled. Your friend performs delightfully, he continued after a pause, on seeing Bingley join the group. And I doubt not that you are an adept in the science yourself, Mr. Darcy. You saw me dance in Meryton, I believe, sir. Yes, indeed, and received no inconsiderable pleasure from the sight. Do you often dance at St. James's? Never, sir. Do you not think it would be a proper compliment to the place? It is a compliment which I never pay to any place if I can avoid it. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. So let's start with from the top. The first thing I see is the Scotch and Irish airs. Scottish and Irish music were very popular for country dancing in the Regency era, and embellishing your dances with Scottish and Irish footwork was likewise popular. If you look at the links to the articles about private balls, you'll notice that a lot of the tunes mentioned are Scottish, and dance manuals like Wilson's and Cherry's talk about using appropriate Scottish and Irish steps to go along with it. The next thing I noticed is that there seems to be six or eight dancers to begin with if you count Kitty and Lydia, a few of the Lucases, and a few officers, with Bingley joining in, presumably also with a partner. I'm counting that as at least eight people more likely 10 counting Bingley, which would be a decent enough number for an impromptu dance at a private evening party, but would have been shockingly small for a formal ball. Country dances tend to be more fun in a fairly big set, but they can be done with as few as three couples. See Thomas Wilson's famous aphorism on the subject. The advantage of short sets would be less time waiting for each couple. You can see a lot of examples of impromptu dancing in Jane Austen's novels, whenever there's music, enough space, and some willing dancers. Sir William asks Mr. Darcy if he's ever danced at the court of St. James's, meaning the royal court in London, so let's talk a little about that. One did not dance for pleasure at St. James's. One danced to be seen. Darcy comes from old money on his father's side, and is the grandson of an earl on his mother's side, so he certainly could attend the court, but he would have found the balls there even more dull and socially anxious than a regular ball. Continuing on in this conversation, let's look at Sir William's clumsy attempt to pair Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy for the dance. Mr. Darcy, with grave propriety, requested to be allowed the honor of her hand, but in vain. Elizabeth was determined, nor did Sir William at all shake her purpose in his attempt at persuasion. You excel so much in the dance, Miss Eliza, that it would be cruel to deny me the happiness of seeing you. And though this gentleman dislikes the amusement in general, he can have no objection, I'm sure, to oblige us for one half hour. The thing my dancer eye notices in this scene is how Sir William describes the proposed dancing as standing up for one half hour. And this perfectly accords with the notion of each dance being about 15 minutes long and being danced in pairs, adding up to half an hour. It's interesting to see just how readily people come up with this estimate in Jane Austen's novels. Moving on, let's look at the next time Darcy asks Elizabeth to dance. After playing some Italian songs, Miss Bingley varied the charm by a lively Scottish air and soon afterwards, Mr. Darcy, drawing near Elizabeth, said to her, Do you not feel a great inclination, Miss Bennet, to see such an opportunity of dancing a reel? She smiled, but made no answer. He repeated the question, with some surprise at her silence. Oh, she said, I heard you before, but I could not immediately determine what to say in reply. You wanted me, I know, to say, yes, that you might have the pleasure of despising my taste, but I always delight in overthrowing those kind of schemes, and cheating a person of their premeditated contempt. I have, therefore, made up my mind to tell you that I do not want to dance a reel at all. And now despise me if you dare. The reel, also called a Scotch reel, was a Scottish dance that was popular in the Regency. It was good for impromptu dancing at home because it only required three or four people. 
It consisted of performing a weaving figure known as a hay or reel, which can also be seen in English country dancing, and then performing a setting step, a stationary figure designed to show off your fancy footwork. A variety of Scottish steps were used for reels, many of which were more complicated than the steps used for English country dancing, and people often raised their arms and whooped in order to imitate Scottish Highlanders. Despite some people thinking those affectations vulgar and tacky, the dance was quite popular even at the highest levels of society. When Elizabeth says she thinks Mr. Darcy is trying to despise her taste, I can read it two different ways. The first way is that she's worried her Scottish steps aren't fancy enough to impress him, and the second is that he thinks that reels in general are vulgar, and Elizabeth's wanting to dance one at all would in itself be considered bad taste. I also noticed here, if they wanted to dance a reel, Darcy would need to find at least one other person to dance with them, though I'm sure Bingley would have been more than happy to oblige. Here's another passage before the Netherfield Ball that mentions dancing. By the by, Charles, are you really serious in meditating a dance at Netherfield? I would advise you, before you determine on it, to consult the wishes of the present party. I am much mistaken if there are not some among us to whom a ball would be rather a punishment than a pleasure. If you mean Darcy, cried her brother, he may go to bed if he chooses before it begins. But as for the ball, it is quite a settled thing. As soon as Nichols has made white soup enough, I shall send round my cards. Private balls, as I said earlier, tended to start later, as late as 10.30 or even 11, and run later than public balls, which is why Darcy could go to bed before the dancing even started, though his ability to sleep through it would depend on his tolerance for background noise. They would take a break from the dancing around 1 or 2 in the morning for a late supper, which is when they would have the white soup Bingley is talking about, and then they would continue on dancing for a few hours, sometimes till dawn. Let's look at some passages from the Netherfield ball scene. The first two dances, however, brought a return of distress. They were dances of mortification. Mr. Collins, awkward and solemn, apologizing instead of attending, and often moving wrong without being aware of it, gave her all the shame and misery which a disagreeable partner for a couple of dances can give. The moment of her release was ecstasy. Clearly, this passage is showing someone struggling to get through an English country dance. To me, apologizing instead of attending seems fairly self-explanatory. Mr. Collins is not paying enough attention to the chosen series of figures to be able to perform them correctly, and thus has to apologize for his mistakes. Even more embarrassingly, he doesn't seem to even realize when he messes up sometimes, which can create a whole other layer of chaos. A few paragraphs down, let's look at Elizabeth dancing with Mr. Darcy. Elizabeth made no answer and took her place in the set amazed at the dignity with which she had arrived and being allowed to stand opposite to Mr. Darcy, and reading in her neighbor's looks their equal amazement in beholding it. They stood for some time without speaking a word, and she began to imagine that their silence was to last through the two dances, and at first was resolved not to break it, till suddenly fancying that it would be a greater punishment to her partner to oblige him to talk, she made some slight observation on the dance. He replied and was silent again. After a pause of some minutes, she addressed him a second time with, It is your turn to say something now, Mr. Darcy. I talked about the dance, and you ought to make some remark on the size of the room or the number of couples. He smiled and assured her that whatever she wished him to say should be said. Very well, that reply will do for the present. Perhaps by the by, I may observe that private balls are much pleasanter than public ones, but now we may be silent. Do you talk by rule, then, when you are dancing? Sometimes. One must speak a little, you know. It would be odd to be entirely silent for half an hour together. What I see in this scene is that Elizabeth and Darcy are not near the top of the set, and with the snowballing start, they have a few minutes to wait before the active dancers incorporate them into the action. That's why the quote says that they stood without speaking a word, rather than they danced without speaking a word. This was seen as a feature of English country dancing again, not a bug. And it would be great if you liked the person you were dancing with, but it would have been absolute torture for Elizabeth. In addition, you once again see that asking for two dances carries the assumption that it will last about half an hour. Austen makes this assumption a lot in her novels. Later in the scene, we see, He made no answer, and they were again silent till they had gone down the dance, when he asked her if she and her sisters did not very often walk to Meryton. This is talking about the dance progression I described earlier, 
where the active couples dance down the dance and do every figure in the sequence, whereas the other couples only fill in when needed. You were not expected to have long conversations while dancing down, and this makes sense for a few reasons. First of all, because you had so much time to talk when traveling up the dance that you really didn't need it. And second, because many of the dance figures take you away from your partner, making it a little awkward to sustain an in-depth conversation. Third, because dances were called extemporaneously and you had to learn and remember the figure sequence while dancing it often. Fourth, because if the band was playing at a vigorous tempo, you might not have enough breath, especially in a long set where you might be continuously dancing the active part for 10 minutes or more. So, going down the set in silence was probably more common than not. At that moment, Sir William Lucas appeared close to them, meaning to pass through the set to the other side of the room. But on perceiving Mr. Darcy, he stopped with a bow of superior courtesy to compliment him on his dancing and his partner. I have been most highly gratified indeed, my dear sir. Such very superior dancing is not often seen. It is evident that you belong to the first circles. Allow me to say, however, that your fair partner does not disgrace you. And I must hope to have this pleasure often repeated, especially when a certain desirable event, my dear Eliza, glancing at Bingley and her sister, shall take place. What congratulations will then flow in? I appeal to you, Mr. Darcy. But let me not interrupt you, sir. You will not thank me from detaining you from the bewitching converse of that young lady whose bright eyes are also upbraiding me. So Austin already told us in the previous passage that they went all the way down the dance without talking and then resumed the conversation. So we can assume at this point that when Sir William stops to talk to Darcy, he and Elizabeth are making their way up, which explains why Sir William felt as if he could stop for a quick chat without interrupting the dance they wouldn't have much to do anyway. In fact, it was fairly common, though not considered the best of manners, for people to come up and chat with the inactive dancers in the dance set. And you'll notice Sir William is more concerned about interrupting Darcy's conversation with Elizabeth than he is about disrupting the dance figures. Let's look at the final passage of interest during Darcy's dance with Elizabeth. I would by no means suspend any pleasure of yours, he coldly replied. She said no more, and they went down the other dance and parted in silence and on each side dissatisfied. Once again, we see the notion of not talking while they're going down the dance, but it's notable that they didn't say anything when they were going up the dance either, which would have happened unless they had started the dance as the bottom couple. Skipping a few pages, I find another passage of interest. The rest of the evening brought her little amusement. She was teased by Mr. Collins, who continued most perseveringly by her side, and though he could not prevail on her to dance with him again, put it out of her power to dance with others. In vain did she entreat him to stand up with somebody else, and offer to introduce him to any young lady in the room. He assured her that as to dancing he was perfectly indifferent, that his chief object was by delicate attentions to recommend himself to her, and that he should therefore make a point of remaining close to her the whole evening. Once again, I'm going to refer to the essays about assembly ball rules and dance etiquette by Paul Cooper. You can see from the samples he analyzes in those essays that although there was some flexibility in regards to rules, it was customary in many places that if a woman turned one man down for a dance, she would not be able to dance that dance with someone else. And sometimes she would not be able to dance again for the rest of the night, though that seems to be a more extreme version. It's not really clear which rule Elizabeth is following. It's possible, in my opinion, that she refused him once and disqualified herself for the rest of the evening. But I think it's more likely because of the mention of him continuing by her side and her trying to make him dance with other people that she only had to sit out one dance, but Mr. Collins kept continually asking her after every set, which she kept turning down and thus ensured she never had a chance to dance again. So that covers the passage of interest to me from Pride and Prejudice. Now let's look at Emma. The proposal of dancing, originating nobody exactly knew where, was so effectually promoted by Mr. and Mrs. Cole that everything was rapidly clearing away to give proper space. Mrs. Weston, capital in her country dances, was seated and beginning an irresistible waltz, and Frank Churchill, coming up with most becoming gallantry to Emma, had secured her hand and led her up to the top. The first thing I notice here is another example of an evening party with an impromptu dance. I love that we get the description of people moving furniture to make room. Second, I note that Mrs. Weston was playing country dances, but the tunes were waltzes. 
Country dancing to waltz tunes had been going on since the 1790s, but the actual couple's dance, the waltz, was still controversial when Emma was being published, though it was finally just starting to gain a little bit of wider acceptance. Couples waltzing was already popular in Europe, but the conservative English were still ambivalent about it, except among the decadent aristocracy who were wild for waltzing. Anyway, in this case, it's clearly a waltz tune being used for country dancing. A few paragraphs later we see, and she led off the dance with genuine spirit and enjoyment. Not more than five couples could be mustered, but the rarity and the suddenness of it made it very delightful. And she found herself well matched in her partner. They were a couple worth looking at. Two dances, unfortunately, were all that could be allowed. It was growing late and Miss Bates became anxious to get home on her mother's account. Emma gets to lead off the first dance, which is a big deal for Regency dancing. The top couple in an English country dance got to select the figure and the tune. Though in this case it sounds as if Mrs. Weston had already chosen a waltz and everybody else just had to follow along, though they could still pick the figures. Ladies were generally the ones who got to make the selection, and there were a couple of different methods for deciding who got to call it. By the early 1800s at public assemblies, people would be given a number as they entered the ballroom and the call would be done in that order. Although some venues also allowed members of the nobility to take precedence and call first. Rank, in fact, was one of the other ways you could decide. So you would just have the ladies call in order of rank, unless there was a special exception like a newly married woman or a debutante's coming out ball. In this case, it's clear that they're doing it by precedence because Emma is the highest ranking woman in the room and she gets to lead off. Additionally, the fact that they only danced two country dances and it was customary only to change partners every two dances means that Emma would have been Frank's only partner for the evening. The next scene that interests me is when Frank is trying to plan a ball. But will there be good room for five couple? I really do not think there will. And on another, after all, five couples are not enough to make it worthwhile to stand out. Five couple are nothing. When one thinks seriously about it, it will not do to invite five couple. It can only be allowable as the thought of the moment. It became certain that the five couples would be at least 10 and very interesting speculation in what possible manner they could be disposed of. The doors of the two rooms were just opposite each other. Might not they use both rooms and dance across the passage? It seemed the best scheme, and yet it was not so good that many of them wanted a better. Emma said it would be awkward. The primary thing I noticed in this passage is the idea that five couples for a long way dance aren't really enough to make it fun. And I kind of agree. I'd certainly made it work with only five before. In fact, I made it work with less. But it's much more satisfying to go down a long set because it gives you more time to dance down as the active couple after waiting so patiently for your turn. I like the differentiation in the idea that five couples are fine for an impromptu dance, which is exactly what happened in the last scene. But if you're purposely planning a dance evening, it's not nearly enough. Emma says pretty much exactly this in the next text of interest. The space, which a quarter of an hour before had been deemed barely sufficient for five couple, was now endeavored to be made out quite enough for ten. We were too magnificent, he said. We allowed unnecessary room. Ten couple may stand here very well. Emma demurred. It would be a crowd, a sad crowd, and what could be worse than dancing without space to turn in? Very true, he gravely replied. It was bad, but he went on measuring, and still he ended with, I think it would be very tolerable room for ten couple. No, no, said she, you're quite unreasonable. It would be so dreadful standing so close. Nothing could be farther from pleasure than to be dancing in a crowd, and a crowd in a little room. Here we see the classic argument about how much room you need to dance comfortably. We do have accounts from the period, complaints really, of people being crammed into ballrooms, but ideally English country dancing requires a good deal of space to function at its best. You can make it work in a tight space, but it's much more fun if you have enough room. Regency dance master Thomas Wilson advised having two and a half feet between couples and four and a half feet between you and your partner. For metric viewers, that's a little less than five six of a meter for the first measurement and a meter and a half for the second. I would also want a margin of an additional meter on each side of the outside of the set for figures like casting. And if you add all that up, that means your dance floor should be at least three and a half meters wide. And for 10 couples in the case of the party Emma is planning, 
close to nine meters or a little less than 30 feet. So you could see why they'd want to open up the adjoining room to make more space. You can also see why you'd need to be able to afford a very large house in order to hold a ball at a private residence. Let's move on to the ball scene. It had just occurred to Mrs. Weston that Mrs. Elton must be asked to begin the ball. She would expect it, which interfered with all their wishes of giving Emma that distinction. Emma heard the sad truth with fortitude. And what are we to do for a partner for her? said Mr. Weston. She will think Frank ought to ask her. Frank turned instantly to Emma to claim her former promise and boasted himself an engaged man, which his father looked his most perfect approbation of. And it then appeared that Mrs. Weston was wanting him to dance with Mrs. Elton himself and that their business was to help persuade him into it, which was done pretty soon. Mr. Weston and Mrs. Elton led the way. Mr. Frank Churchill and Miss Woodhouse followed. Emma must submit to stand second to Mrs. Elton, though she had always considered the ball as peculiarly for her. It was almost enough to make her think of marrying. The question of who has the right to lead off a ball is interesting here. Once again, they're using the rules of precedence to determine the order of leading dances. Emma, once again, would normally outrank everyone else, but Mrs. Elton gets a special honor of being a new bride. And once again, we see passing concern about having a long enough set to make the dancing fun. From the same paragraph, I also find the following excerpt interesting. She was more disturbed by Mr. Knightley's not dancing than by anything else. There he was among the standers by where he ought not to be. He ought to be dancing not classing himself with the husbands, fathers, and whist players who were pretending to feel an interest in the dance until their rubbers were made up. So young as he looked. I love the comment about how the married man were just waiting to escape into the card room. Notice once again that having a single young man like Mr. Knightley sitting out the dancing at a ball was considered highly unusual. Anyone else getting minor Darcy vibes from Knightley's behavior? I think the only reason it's not taken as snobbishness in this case is because Mr. Knightley is known to be a good and generous man, and not dancing is just one of his eccentricities. Skipping ahead in the scene, let's look at the incident between Mr. Elton and Harriet. The two last dances before supper were begun, and Harriet had no partner, the only young lady sitting down, and so equal had been hitherto the number of dancers that how there could be anyone disengaged was the wonder but Emma's wondered lessons soon afterwards on seeing Mr. Elton sauntering about. He would not ask Harriet to dance if it were possible to be avoided. She was sure he would not, and she was expecting him every moment to escape into the card room. Escape, however, was not his plan. He came to the part of the room where the sitters by were collected, spoke to some, and walked about in front of them as if to show his liberty and his resolution of maintaining it. He did not omit being sometimes directly before Miss Smith or speaking to those who were close to her. Emma saw it. She was not yet dancing. She was working her way up from the bottom and had therefore leisure to look around. And by only turning her head a little, she saw it all. When she was halfway up the set, the whole group were exactly behind her and she would no longer allow her eyes to watch. But Mr. Elton was so near, she heard every syllable of a dialogue, which just then took place between him and Mrs. Weston. It looks as if they had an even gender balance for the dancing, so that if one gentleman sat out, it would have meant that one lady would have been without a partner. I could easily imagine people scrambling to secure their next partner and poor Harriet getting lost in the shuffle until only Mr. Elton was left. And of course, he'd rather die than ask her to dance. Right, so I forgot to say the reason that Mr. Elton especially doesn't want to dance with Harriet now is that it's the last dance before supper, which means if he dances with her, he's going to have to escort her into supper and attend her for the rest of the meal, and that would be massively awkward. In addition, the phrase that Emma wasn't yet dancing because she was working her way up from the bottom makes much more sense when you understand how the long waist formation worked in Eng during the Regency and allowed all that free time. And even when Emma could no longer look, she still ate at leisure to listen. Just a few paragraphs later, let's look at Harriet's rescue. In another moment, a happier sight caught her. Mr. Knightley leading Harriet to the set. Never had she been more surprised, seldom more delighted than that instant. She was all pleasure and gratitude, both for Harriet and herself, and longed to be thanking him. And 
though too distant for speech, her countenance said much as soon as she could catch his eye again. His dancing proved to be just what she believed it, extremely good, and Harriet would have seemed almost too lucky if it had not been for the cruel state of things before, and for the very complete enjoyment and very high sense of the distinction which her happy features announced. It was not thrown away on her. She bounded higher than ever, flew farther down the middle, and was in a continual course of smiles. The stepping in Regency English country dancing could be very bouncy, which is how I see Harriet bounding so high in the dancing. The line about her flying down the middle is a reference to the figure down the middle and up again, which was one of the most common progressive figures in Regency dancing. Sometimes when I'm reading collections of new country dances for the year 18 whatever, it feels like three quarters of the dances at least have down the middle and up again in them. I get the impression that the figure could often get rowdy because you have dancing masters like Thomas Wilston telling people that they shouldn't go too far on down the middle and up again. Indeed, it often gets rowdy in modern English country dancing as well. So that concludes passages of note from Emma. The next novel I want to cover is Northanger Abbey because it has the most dance scenes of the remaining novels. The first passage of interest is Catherine's first dance with Henry Tilney. The master of ceremonies introduced her to a very gentleman-like young man as a partner. His name was Tilney. He seemed to be about four or five and twenty, and was rather tall, had a pleasing countenance, a very intelligent and lively eye, and, if not quite handsome, was very nearly it. His address was good, and Catherine felt herself in high luck. There was little leisure for speaking while they danced, but, when they were seated for tea, she found him as agreeable as she had already given him credit for being. Again, because everyone in attendance was introduced to the Master of Ceremonies, he could then introduce them to everyone else in the room, which is what we see here. You'll notice in this dance that there was very little leisure for speaking, and that sometimes happened in a country dance. There could be several reasons for this. The set could have been short, or the figures could have involved all three couples at a time for most of the sequence. For example, if you called the sequence of hey on the opposite side and then again on your own, down the middle and up again, and swing your quarters, that would require almost continuous dancing for the couples going up the set as well as the active couples dancing down, so there would not be a lot of spare time to talk. I'm also assuming that her dances with Tilney were the last before tea because it seems to have been customary to escort your last partner into either the tea or the supper and then attend them through the meal. It's also possible that they simply weren't changing partners, which seems to have been more tolerated in Bath based on what characters say later, but we'll get to that in a little while. The next mention of dancing comes when the narrator talks about Catherine and Isabella's fast friendship. They called each other by their Christian name, were always arm in arm when they walked, pinned up each other's trains for the dance, and were not to be divided in the set. For dancing, you don't want your skirt dragging the ground, obviously, so I love the little detail of them pinning up each other's trains. Apparently, that was a vestige of early 18 aughts fashion, because there don't seem to be trains on ball gowns in the 1810s, and Jane Austen originally wrote Northanger Abbey in the 18 aughts when she was living in Bath. The line about not being divided in the set is talking about them wanting to stand next to each other in the dance set, even if the method for assigning places dictated that they shouldn't. From what I can gather, this habit of essentially letting your friend cut in line to be near you was common but frowned upon. See Paul Cooper's paper on assembly ball rules, which shows several sets of rules from the 1780s through the early 18 aughts, in which ladies are asked not to let people cut in front of them in the set. In particular, the rules from the Southampton Assembly in Jane Austen's own native Hampshire from 1793, when Jane herself would have been 17 and therefore of dancing age, explains this prohibition thus. The prevailing custom of ladies allowing their acquaintance to stand above them in the set, having been the origin of much dispute. It looks as if society eventually found a remedy for this in the form of dance tickets. And in the early 18 aughts, we start seeing assembly rooms requiring ladies to draw a number for their place in the set and to pin it on their dress so that people knew that they were in their proper place. Since Austen wrote Northanger Abbey in the 18 aughts, it would have been the transitional time for this rule, and thus we see characters letting their friends cut in the set quite often. Moving on, let's look at the next ballroom scene. Of her dear Isabella, whom she particularly longed to point out that gentleman, she could see nothing. They were in different sets. She was separated from all her party and away from all her acquaintance. One mortification succeeded another, and from the whole she deduced this useful lesson, that to go previously engaged to a ball does not necessarily increase either the dignity or enjoyment of a young lady. 
From such a moralizing strain as this, she was suddenly roused by the touch on the shoulder and turning round perceived Mrs. Hughes directly behind her, attending by Miss Tilney and a gentleman. I beg your pardon, Miss Morland, said she, for this liberty, but I cannot anyhow get to Miss Thorpe, and Mrs. Thorpe said she was sure you would have not the least objection of letting this young lady buy you. Mrs. Hughes could not have applied to any creature in the room more happy to oblige than Catherine. The young ladies were introduced to each other, Miss Tilney expressing a proper sense of such goodness, Miss Morland with real delicacy of a generous mind, making light of the obligation, and Mrs. Hughes, satisfied with having so respectably settled her young charge, returned to her party. Catherine, interested at once by her appearance and her relationship to Mr. Tilney, was desirous of being acquainted with her, and readily talked, therefore, whenever she could think of anything to say, and had courage and leisure for saying it but the hindrance thrown in the way of a very speedy intimacy by the frequent want of one or more of those requisites prevented their doing more than going through the first rudiments of an acquaintance. There's a lot to unpack here. I'm guessing the sets were quite long and the room was quite crowded, both because they seemed to have a lot of time for talking and because Catherine couldn't get near enough to Isabella. Notice the implication that they intended to stand next to each other again and notice the ease with which Miss Tilney's chaperone allows her to cut in line so that she doesn't have to start at the bottom, seemingly more concerned with the fact that the two young ladies were not yet acquainted than for the impropriety of cutting into the set. In addition, we again see the characters chatting away while they're making their way up the set without much to do. I would actually hazard a guess that the top couple had not yet danced down to their place when Miss Tilney cut in, because it would have been much easier to intrude when Catherine and her partner were still completely inactive. A few paragraphs down, we see another quote of interest. When the orchestra struck up a fresh dance, James would have led his fair partner away, but she resisted. I tell you, Mr. Morland, cried she, I would not do such a thing for all the world. How can you be so teasing? Only conceive, my dear Catherine, what your brother wants me to do. He wants me to dance with him again, though I tell him that it's a most improper thing and entirely against the rules. He would make us the talk of the place if we were not to change partners. Upon my honor, said James, in these public assemblies, it's as often done as not. Again, you can observe a degree of fluidity in the rules of propriety as it comes to partner changing. Catherine danced with Mr. Tilney twice at the first ball, one set before tea and one set after, without either of them thinking that was a sign of undue attention. And similarly, Catherine's brother James seems to think it's all right for public assemblies, the implication being that it might be frowned upon in a private ball where everyone was presumed to know each other. Perhaps it was this way more so in a tourist trap like Bath that would have been fairly anonymous and very crowded compared to the assembly rooms in a country town where everyone would know each other. Indeed, the first ball that Catherine attends is so crowded and anonymous that she couldn't get a partner at all. The next passage I notice is from later in this ballroom scene. John Thorpe came up to her soon afterwards and said, Well, Miss Morland, I suppose you and I are to stand up and jig it again together. Oh no, I am much obliged to you. Our two dances are over. And besides, I am tired and do not mean to dance any more. Do not you? Then let's walk about and quiz people. Come along with me. I will show you four of the greatest quizzes in the room. My two younger sisters and their partners. I have been laughing at them this half hour. Again, Catherine excused herself. And at last, he walked off to quiz his sisters by himself. The rest of the evening she found very dull. Mr. Tilney was drawn away from their party at tea to attend that of his partner. Two things here strike me. Thorpe's sisters are clearly dancing if he's quizzing both them and their partners, and yet he feels free enough to quiz them. Another example of how free people felt to chat with the inactive couples in a set. And of course, the other thing I notice is that Mr. Tilney has to attend his last dance partner at tea as per the custom. The next ballroom scene has a long passage of interest Austin tells us specifically that the ball in question is a cotillion ball, which means cotillions would make up a large portion of the program as well as the regular country dances. Cotillions were fully choreographed dances with figures that had to be learned and memorized in advance. And in preparation for a ball, they would print a list of all the cotillions to be danced with their figures so that people could learn and practice them before the ball. In some places, they would even have rehearsals for those who wanted to get in some extra practice at the figures. However, the cotillions themselves don't really figure into the story because the characters in the novel didn't start dancing until after the cotillions were over and the country dances had started. In fact, the Tilneys don't even arrive at the ball until after the cotillions have ended. 
Henry Tilney has asked Catherine to dance, and we read, Scarcely had they worked themselves into the quiet possession of a place, however, when her attention was claimed by John Thorpe, who stood behind her. Hey day, Miss Morland, said he. What's the meaning of this? I thought you and I were to dance together. I wonder that you should think so, for you never asked me. What chap have you there? Catherine satisfied his curiosity. Tilney, he repeated. Hmm, I do not know him. Good figure of a man, well put together. Does he want a horse? This was the last sentence by which he could weary Catherine's attention for he was just then borne off by the resistless pressure of a long string of passing ladies. Her partner now drew near her and said, "'That gentleman would have put me out of patience "'if he had stayed with you half a minute longer. "'He has no business to withdraw the attention "'of my partner from me. "'We have entered into a contract of mutual agreeableness "'for the space of an evening, "'and all our agreeableness belongs solely to each other "'for that time.'" Once again, we have an example of non-dancers coming up and just casually striking up conversations with the inactive dancers in a set. But the danger of that turns out to be Mr. Thorpe getting crushed by a crowd of people passing by. Despite this seeming to be a commonplace occurrence of being interrupted by conversation while inactive in a dance set, Mr. Tilney starts feeling possessive that someone, particularly another man, was talking to his partner which seems reasonable. It's similar to Sir William's apologizing to Darcy and Elizabeth for interrupting their conversation, which again was half the point of these dances. I'm skipping over the whole famous conversation that Catherine and Mr. Tilney have about the similarities between marriage and dancing, because that conversation is more about the social contract than it is about actual dance details, and we're here more for the logistics of dancing. After that famous dialogue, however, yet another person stops to talk to Catherine and Mr. Tilney, and this passage has some good dance details. Here their conversation closed, the demands of the dance becoming now too importunate for a divided attention. Soon after their reaching the bottom of the set, Catherine perceived herself to be earnestly regarded by a gentleman who stood among the onlookers immediately behind her partner. He was a very handsome man of a commanding aspect, past the bloom but not past the vigor of life, and with his eyes still directed towards her, she saw him presently address Mr. Tilney in a familiar whisper. Confused by his notice and blushing for fear of its being excited by something wrong in her appearance, she turned away her head. But while she did so, the gentleman retreated and her partner coming nearer said, I see that you guess what I have just been asked. That gentleman knows your name and you have a right to know his. It is General Tilney, my father. The implication is that the dance became too demanding when they were dancing down, which we can infer because the action resumes after reaching the bottom of the set. It's becoming quite a trope in Austin that conversation stops when they're dancing down. Also, can I just say, poor Mr. Tilney, won't people just leave him alone to talk to his partner in peace? There's one last dance scene from Northanger Abbey that I want to look at, starting with this little gem. Catherine, meanwhile, Undisturbed by presentiments of such an evil, or of any evil at all except that of having but a short set to dance down, enjoyed her usual happiness with Henry Tilney. Because once again, who wants a short set? Anyway, let's look a few paragraphs down from there for my next little gem. There was something, however, in his words which repaid her for the pain of confusion, and that something occupied her mind so much that she drew back for some time, forgetting to speak or to listen, and almost forgetting where she was, till, roused by the voice of Isabella, and looking up, saw her with Captain Tilney, preparing to give them hands across. So there's a few interesting things going on here. First of all, I assume that Catherine and Mr. Tilney are still moving up the set at this point, because she's zoning out about conversation, not zoning out about figures. Then you have the line about Isabella and Captain Tilney preparing to give them hands across. This is especially surprising because earlier in the scene, Captain Tilney asked if Catherine could introduce him to Isabella, which means that she and Tilney would have already got their spot in the set before Captain Tilney would have had time to ask Isabella, which means by all rights, they should be below Henry and Catherine in the set. Yet they appear to be the active dancers in this scenario dancing down because they are the ones actively giving hands across while Catherine and Henry are still inactive. That means not only did Captain Tilney succeed in getting Isabella to dance with him, but the two of them found a way to cut into the set and get ahead of Henry and Catherine. Like I said earlier, there's a lot of shenanigans going on with cutting in sets. That wraps up Northanger Abbey. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video and are interested in seeing part two where we cover the rest of the novels, 
please like us and subscribe. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can also subscribe to our Patreon. Thanks once again for watching. Enjoy the rest of Virtual Jane Con. And as always, have an ostentatiously good day.